today major developments out of the war in the Middle East. The seven-day truce between Israel and Hamas has ended and fighting has resumed. The Israeli government says rockets were launched from Gaza overnight in the final minutes of the truce. And the prime minister's office claims Hamas did not meet its obligation to release all of the women hostages, thereby violating the terms of the deal. During the seven-day truce, 105 hostages were released from Hamas captivity, along with Israel releasing 240 prisoners. International mediators are continuing discussions in Qatar in the hopes of another breakthrough. As new, alarming reporting in The New York Times pulls the curtain back on Israel's dismissal of previous intelligence it received about Hamas's plan of attack. The Times reports, according to documents, emails, and interviews, that Israel obtained Hamas's battle plan over a year ago. Quote, the approximately 40-page document, which the Israeli authorities codenamed Jericho Wall, outlined point by point exactly the kind of devastating invasion that led to the deaths of about 1,200 people. The translated document, which was reviewed by The New York Times, did not set a date for the attack, described a methodical assault designed to overwhelm the fortifications around the Gaza Strip, take over Israeli cities, and storm key military bases, including a division headquarters. Hamas followed the blueprint with shocking precision. The document called for a barrage of rockets at the outset of the attack, drones to knock out the security cameras and automated machine guns along the border, and gunmen to pour into Israel en masse in paragliders, on motorcycles and on foot, all of which happened on October 7th. The Times notes, it is unclear whether Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu or other top political leaders saw the document. Now, we should note NBC News has not seen it, and in response to this reporting, Israel's military said the IDF is currently focused on eliminating the threat from the terrorist organization Hamas. Questions of this kind will be looked into in a later stage. The Times reports on the environment in which the horrific October 7th attack occurred. Underpinning all these failures was a single, fatally inaccurate belief that Hamas lacked the capability to attack and would not dare to do so. That belief was so ingrained in the Israeli government, officials said, that they disregarded growing evidence to the contrary. And that is where we start this hour with staff writer for The New York Times and author of Rise and Kill First, The Secret History of Israel's Targeted Assassinations, Ronan Bergman, who shares a byline on that reporting. Also with us, former CIA director, now an MSNBC senior national security analyst, John Brennan, and former Washington Post Jerusalem bureau chief, Janine Zakaria. Ronan, let's start with you. Talk about your reporting and what you found regarding Israel's intelligence. How was this possible? Thank you. So more than a year ago, Israel was able to get to obtain a top secret Hamas document that start with a phrase from the Quran. Whoever goes through this gate surprisingly, so surprising the people, the enemy on the other side, Allah, this phrase said, will bless. This is now part of the emblem of the operation that Hamas used in every kind of publication, in every kind of uh, video or, or announcement. This is around 40 pages of a detailed, meticulous plan how to take down the, um, the front, the Israeli front, how to break the fence, the fence that was considered to be invincible, how to destroy and demolish the fortification and allow massive Hamas forces to um, infiltrate Israel. In a time when the Israeli intelligence assessed that Hamas can only deploy two platoons, up to 70 people. The plan was about almost 2,000 people in 60 different places. So not a raid, but a full-scale invasion. Now, people ask, how come the Israelis who were with the superior hand when taking this war, when obtaining this information, obtaining this document, didn't do anything with this. It's, it's maybe hard to explain, but the Israelis saw this plan not as a viable plan. They saw it as a dream plan. They saw it as, a, they call it a compass in one of the assessment um, documents re written about uh, Jericho Wall, the code name for the invasion. Uh, they called it a compass for the building of a force. 
So this is where Hamas wants to be, not where Hamas is at current time. And the Israelis believe that there's a gap. Hamas is not capable of launching such a massive attack throughout the front. This is where they got it um, deadly wrong, strategically wrong, leading to this catastrophe. Deadly wrong, strategically wrong. D Director Brennan, what alarms went off for you as you read this reporting? Well, a lot of alarms, Alicia. Um, it is exceptionally rare to be able to obtain a copy of a detailed battle plan of your enemy, especially more than a year in advance of the attack of the battle. And so it demonstrates that Israel did have access to these inner circles of Hamas in sometime in 2022. And they made a determination at that time, as Ronan said, that this was beyond the capabilities of Hamas. And at the time, it probably was. But the problem is that their analysis, their assessment remained static over the course of the last 12, 14, 15 months, however long. This plan should have driven Israel's collection capabilities against Hamas to see whether or not Hamas was making progress, realizing the aspirational qualities of this plan. They should have continued to take a look and to see whether they could identify any indications that Hamas was moving along the path of progressing on this plan. And clearly, there were indications that they were, which is why in the reporting it says that an analyst a few months ago raised to the attention of senior Israeli defense officials that they felt as though there were aspects of that plan that were being observed by Israeli intelligence. So this was a breakdown of the system. But again, it just demonstrates that Israel had this opportunity more than a year ago to be able to leverage access to what Hamas was planning, but failed to do so in the last year plus. So, Director Brennan, let me ask you a different question, which is if you were U.S. intelligence and you know that your ally was given a copy of their opponent's battle plan and they ignored it, what risk does that pose? What challenges does that then pose for U.S. intelligence? Well, first of all, given the close relationship between Israel and U.S. intelligence agencies, um, I would have uh, liked, if I was still in the, uh, in the U.S. intelligence community, to have been given access to that, that plan. Because then our analysts, our collection experts, could have taken a look at whether or not we had anything in our files, in our databases, that could, in fact, give the Israelis some insight into whether or not Hamas was actually being able to realize these capabilities that they sought. And so it makes me wonder now about the systemic breakdown that existed within Israeli intelligence. It's not just in intelligence circles, it's in the military. And I don't know how high up it went within the Israeli uh, national security apparatus or up to policymakers. But clearly, there was a breakdown here that there was a complacency that set in, that there was a feeling that Hamas was not going to go along this path because it had too much at stake with all the, the Gazan residents that were going into Israel and uh, working and earning money and bringing back into Gaza. So there were faulty assumptions across the mm -hmm. board that unfortunately you know, contributed to the October 7th uh, disaster. Janine, I want to pick up on something that Director Brennan said there, which is this idea that we don't know if Netanyahu was made aware of this. Given this new reporting, given these questions of Israeli intelligence, of the Israeli government, how does that change already shifting dynamics within Israel? I mean, look, I think that, you know, it's it's a matter of the now right now. I mean, right now, Prime Minister Netanyahu is, prob is very focused on the actual breakdown of the ceasefire, what you had happen today. And Ronen can talk more about the implications for the intelligence community and for the day after and whatnot. There was some early reporting prior to Ronen's report about how there was a young woman analyst within the what's called Unit 8200 who was really pushing this. And mm -hmm. some of the male counterparts were saying, oh, don't bother me with this. And so maybe there was some sexism in there as well. But I think at the moment, what they're focused on in Israel is really uh, the breakdown in the release of the hostages. You had this nightly 
horrific uh, ritual where you were waiting to see which 10 Israelis were going to be released from captivity. And now that's shifted to lists of people who have been murdered in captivity. You have um, the father, Yarden Bibas, who was shown in a hostage video um, where Hamas is telling him that his wife and his 10-month-old baby and four-year-old son have been killed. And we don't know if that's true or not. I mean, you are right now, Israel is so focused on what's happening at the moment and the seemingly inability now to continue with the hostage releases. That's really the top story there.